Oral questions, question oral. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, Canada had a pandemic alert system that was admired by everyone. But in 2018, the Liberal government cancelled this mandate for Canadian experts. They didn't want to contradict official data from the Chinese government. Mr. Speaker, why? Is this Prime Minister listening more to the Chinese government than our Canadian experts? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, that's entirely false. Since the beginning, we've relied on expert advice and funding and personnel have remained constant since 2015 for that unit. And we're concerned by reports saying that they couldn't do their work, even though for several weeks the minister conducted independent examination so their work could continue. We took the pandemic seriously from day one, and we're working with experts. That's what we've done since the beginning. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has just said that he's listening to experts. But experts, well, senior officials have said that the Liberal government's decision was incomprehensible. Our Canadian experts are denouncing the ideological decision of the PMM. When the Prime Minister trusts Chinese data more than our own Canadian data, why? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, that's just any anything. It's not true. Since the beginning, we've been working with scientists and we've been listening to them. And in terms of the agency he's talking about, the funding and the personnel of that agency have remained the same since 2015. And moreover, we heard concerns from public servants and we conducted an investigation. We started one a few weeks ago so we know what could happen and we can continue to work with scientists as best possible. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said that he would follow what our allies were doing when it comes to Huawei. As part of the Five Eyes, we share intelligence with the United Kingdom. This morning, their House of Commons found that Huawei is strongly linked to the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party, despite claims to the contrary. Why is this Prime Minister ignoring all the warnings about Huawei in Canada's 5G network? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, that's simply not true. We've worked very closely with our allies and Five Eyes partners around the world to ensure the safety and security of Canadians and of our infrastructure. We will continue to make decisions based on expert advice, on our intelligence and security professionals as we move forward to do what we need to do to keep Canadians safe in an increasingly interconnected world. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, his security exports are reading the report out of the UK that found that Huawei had been financed by the Chinese state to a tune of $75 billion in the last three years. It also found that Huawei had engaged in a variety of intelligence, security and intellectual property violations around the world. In Canada, the National Post has reported that Huawei theft may have led to the downfall of Nortel, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, four of the five Ives have spoken when it comes to Huawei. Why is this Prime Minister the only one with his eyes closed? Honourable Prime Minister. We continue to be very focused on keeping Canadians safe. We are certainly aware of all these reports and are looking very carefully at them. Uh, but we trust our experts in our security realm, in our intelligence realm, to make fact-based recommendations to us. They are gathering information from our partners. They are looking at the situation. We will move forward in a responsible way that keeps Canadians safe, as we have every step of the way. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the potential closure of the Come By Chance refinery could mean up to 1,400 job losses across Newfoundland and Labrador. It would affect dozens of harbour and outport communities in the province. We're also learning that it could create a severe propane shortage, leaving 2,000 households relying on ferry services during the winter. The head of the local steelworkers union said that the natural resource minister has been silent. Mr. Speaker, when will that minister finally speak up for the people of Arnold's Cove and the citizens of Newfoundland and Labrador? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, it is lovely to hear the Conservatives finally realizing there is a Newfoundland and Labrador that we need to preoccupy ourselves with. We have been working with them very closely, both our Minister of Natural Resources and the new Premier, whom I spoke to just days ago, to talk about how we can continue to work to support workers in Newfoundland and Labrador and indeed in energy sector across the country. We will continue to be there to stand up for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. We will continue to be there to support our workers right across the country as we move forward through this difficult time and into decades to come. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, yesterday in my question, I had barely pronounced the word machine gun when right away the PM responded by talking about party financing. The idea associations in the brain, the brain can make her crazy. Then I asked him if he knew Mr. Weiwei, a criminal arrested in Toronto, and right away he talked about Liberal Party financing. He must be important, Mr. Weiwei, for uh, Liberal Party funding. Is this because Mr. Weiwei and his gang stopped funding the Liberal Party that, because they requested the wage subsidy? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The member for La Prairie. Yesterday, the National Post reported that a rich Toronto businessman, Mr. Weiwei, was arrested for arms possession and held an underground casino. Mr. Weiwei met with the PM on May 6, 2016, accompanied by the founder of Wealth One Bank. Three days later, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wei Wei met with the PM again to discuss trade relations between China and Canada. So here's another simple question. How much all of these meetings between the Prime Minister and rich Chinese investors from Toronto have raked in for the Liberal Party? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, the rules we have in place for the federal government uh, for party financing are, are very robust. And ours are even stricter. Party financing activities are all public, and we even invite journalists to take part in them to observe. Instead of acting in secret, the other parties, the Conservatives and the Bloc, should make their funding activities public so that Canadians can see who is funding them. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As small businesses, fear to have to close their doors because of COVID-19. Big companies are making record profits on COVID-19. We are proposing a tax on excessive profits of big companies during this pandemic. Can Is the Prime Minister on the side of billionaires or small businesses? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The first thing that we did when we came to power in 2015 was to increase taxes on the richest 1 percent so that we could reduce taxes for the middle class. And that's exactly what we did. But unfortunately, the new Democrats voted against this initiative. We are always going to try to create economic wealth and ensure that our tax system is fair for everyone. And we're always going to help the middle class and those who are working hard to reach it. And we're going to get through this pandemic together by taking care of the health and our economy. Health. Mr. Speaker, I spoke with Jennifer and Kane, Dominion grocery store workers who barely earn minimum wage and are struggling to get by, while large corporate grocery stores made massive profits off the pandemic. We're proposing a tax on excess profits made by wealthy corporations during the pandemic. Now, does the Prime Minister stand with billionaire profiteers or does he stand with working people? Will the Prime Minister tax the excess profits made by wealthy corporations off the pandemic? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the extraordinary frontline workers like Jennifer who every day help keep food on our shelves, uh, kept, keep our economy rolling, in the, even in the di most difficult moments of the shutdown. That is why we stepped up on supports for workers, for small businesses, for families, and we will continue to work to ensure uh, that we're supporting Canadians through this pandemic and beyond. In regards to the wealthy, first thing we did was raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% and lower them for the middle class. Unfortunately, the NDP voted against that initiative.
The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Mr. Speaker, today we found out that some Quebec schools have had to resort to using private firms to test their teachers for COVID and keep their students safe because the Prime Minister has failed to get rapid tests into their hands. No. Our publicly funded health care system, which to be very clear the Conservative Party strongly supports, is breaking because the Prime Minister has failed to do his job and get these tests into the hands of Canadians when other countries around the world have done so months ago. Yep. Why? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we've worked with provinces and territories to make sure that they have the tools, the financial support, the expertise, the additional personnel to manage the outbreak. We'll continue to work with provinces like Ontario, Quebec, and indeed all the provinces and territories to ensure they have what they need. Mr. Speaker, this is a complex situation. As the member knows, we've approved a number of rapid tests, and we have been all along. And Mr. Speaker, we'll make sure that the provinces and territories have equal access to those tests as soon as they arrive. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. They've done such a great job that some provinces have had to send tests to California to be processed. They've done such a great job that people are waiting 10 days for their results. And now we're seeing Quebec schools having to use private firms against the notion of publicly funded health care in Canada because of their failure to procure tests. This government is deceiving Canadians. There are no rapid tests in the hands of Canadians, no widespread use, and it's because of their failure and this minister's incompetence. When will it be in widespread use? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and it appears the member opposite is deceiving Canadians because, in fact, we've had rapid tests in the field since early months of COVID-19, supporting rural and remote communities, Indigenous communities to make sure they have access to testing in a rapid and convenient way because they are such fragile and vulnerable communities. Mr. Speaker, we've spent billions of dollars supporting provinces and territories to boost up their capacity to test, to trace, to isolate. We've got rapid response programs to go into hot spots to support uh, provinces and territories with human resources challenges and we'll continue Mr. Speaker to do whatever it takes to help Canadians through this. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. To be clear, this minister considers a 10-day wait for tests rapid. It's just it's ridiculous. The reality is is that somebody standing in line waiting for their results in any part of the country today is not going to have an access to a rapid test because this minister has failed to do her job. We know that these tests aren't going to be available in widespread use at the earliest in next year, and it's because they've failed. We're going into Thanksgiving weekend. We're hearing warnings about an even greater outbreak because we don't have rapid tests. When will these tests be in widespread use across the can uh, country? Well, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I reiterate my offer to uh, have the member opposite briefed by the department to understand that testing is really only one aspect of containing COVID-19. Of course, testing is an important aspect, but provinces also need the opportunity to contact trace, to isolate, to ensure they protect vulnerable communities. Mr. Speaker, we've been working on this side of the House since day one. I encourage the member opposite to learn a bit more about how to contain these outbreaks. The Honourable before Louis Saint Laurent, Mr. Speaker, since day one, the government has been dragging its heels in terms of adopting rapid, rapid testing for COVID. The result is we've learned that schools in the Quebec region have to call on a private company to test for testing results for teachers. Sometimes Quebec has to wait six, nine or ten days for results. Why? Because this government took a long time to evaluate rapid testing. Why? The right honourable, the honourable minister. I've had a good discussion with my colleague, Mr. Dubay. ...reports that we'll continue to offer to Quebec and to the Quebecois to ensure that they have what they need as they uh, combat the second wave. Mr. Speaker, we have approved rapid tests, we have rapid tests in the field, and they are not the only solution, Mr. Speaker, to combating COVID-19. We also have to ensure that we have human resources to contact trace, to isolate close contacts. And Mr. Speaker, we're there for Quebec for those issues as well. We'll continue to work with the provinces and territories on this side, Mr. Speaker, to meet them with what they need to continue the virus. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Dubé, like all Canadians, wants to have rapid testing because this way teachers won't have to wait days and days for results. School boards won't have to pay private companies. So here's a simple question, Minister. How come in Japan they've had rapid testing since March and in the US since August? But the government just woke up last week. The Honourable Minister. 
apply to Health Canada to get approval for rapid tests, we've been able to quickly turn around those approvals. In fact, the last test was in under 30 days. Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to work with industry and to ensure that applicants apply to Canada to sell these rapid tests here. But I will repeat, Mr. Speaker, they are not a silver bullet to managing COVID-19. In fact, experts around the world have said that you need to have a robust strategy to contain the virus that includes, of course, testing, but also contact tracing, also isolation. Mr. Speaker, we'll stop at nothing to support provinces and territories to protect their citizens. Thank you. I can appreciate the honourable members distancing themselves, but they don't have to talk loud. They can cut their masks on and go to the side and do it quietly. They don't have to shout across the aisle to hear what they're saying uh, with their friends. The honourable member for Banff Airdrie. October 15th marks Infant Loss Remembrance Day. It's a difficult day for many families across Canada. And parents grieving the loss of a child deserve compassion from their government. And certainly no grieving parent should ever have to navigate a cold, heartless bureaucracy. The HUMA report sets for, uh, that's called Supporting Families After the Loss of an Infant Child sets a clear path forward to ensure that parents don't suffer any undue financial or emotional distress as a result of government programming. That report, though, has been gathering dust for nearly two years. So when are the Liberals finally going to take action? The Honourable Minister. Pick one. The Honourable Minister. Pick one. Anyone. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to assure the Honourable Member that our policies are informed with making sure that children have the best possible start in life. We have uh, re-engineered our programs to make sure that uh, the processes to obtain them are easy and efficient for people. We have hired uh, a number of agents to make sure that people's questions about government programs are answered. And we've also uh, a tasked thousands of trusted community liaison officers to be able to go out into the community to bring people into government programs and get the benefits that they are eligible for instead of uh, having them miss on those uh, benefits year in, year out. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the bloc leader asked, asked the Prime Minister an excellent question. How much did these meetings uh, with Mr. Weiwei and the CEO of Wealth One bring in for the Liberal Party. We know he brought in a million dollars for the Trudeau Foundation and a nice statue of the PM's father to boot. We know that in 2016, 70 percent of funding in the PM's riding in Montreal came from Toronto and Vancouver. We also know that Mr. Weiwei donated at least $2,000 to the Liberal Party. That's what we know, Mr. Speaker. But in the end, how much money was raked in for the Liberals for these meetings with Mr. Weiwei and the CEO of Wealth One. Can we know? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would invite my Honourable colleague from the Bloc to join us at the Liberal Party in terms of going beyond the very strict law on party funding. We know that the Liberal Party decided to go beyond these strict regulations, for example, by increasing transparency and inviting journalists to attend our funding activities and so we don't do them in secret like the Bloc and the Conservatives do. So the indignation of my honourable colleague should be attenuated by that fact. The honourable member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, we know that the Liberals could tell us if they went beyond this law. But anyway, a banker who was hoping for a positive decision from the federal government met with the PM personally for $1,500. Crim uh, criminals who were operating at an illegal casino were able to meet him personally as well for $1,500. You just have to roll the red carpet, Mr. Speaker, and pay the maximum under the law to meet the PM personally and sell him your deal. And in 2020, is this really how we want the Liberals to do party, party funding? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're proposing to do political funding by going beyond what uh, the Election Act calls for, and that's something the Bloc and the Conservatives have decided not to do. Since the beginning, the, the Prime Minister has been very clear. Liberal Party financing 
occurs at events where the media is inviting, invited and where is there increased transparency and we and to date, Mr. Speaker, the Bloc and the Conservatives have refused, refused to do the same thing, so we ask them to do the same. The Honourable Member for Mani Kwagan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, no one is beyond the law, but my colleagues from La Prairie and Rivière du Nord have said that it's important to make party uh, funding public. It was the case in Ottawa before people thought they could do better. And this avoids politicians from having to take pictures with criminals to fund their campaigns or to take pictures with bankers waiting for favours. What Quebecers see in such pictures is that political decisions can be bought. Are the Liberals against public funding because cronyism pays more? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. I'm not surprised to hear the bloc talking about election funding and financing because that's what they've been doing since la last week. They've been waiting, preparing for elections. Their leader has been clear that he wants elections right away. We're in the midst of a pandemic, so why are they preparing for a pandemic? We're trying to help our companies and we're trying to help workers who have lost their jobs. We're working for them. So while they're talking about elections, we're going to be here for Canadians. The Honourable Member from Megantic Lerable. We're in the midst of a pandemic, but we shouldn't be spreading the virus by exchanging our objects, but the government has just announced that it's going to ban safe plastic packaging. So the, there are many workers in these companies who produce these products who won't have jobs. So that's the reality of the situation. So why is the Prime Minister endangering the health of Canadians and at the same time hampering the lives, livelihoods of these workers? The Honourable Minister of the Environment, Mr. Speaker, Canadians know full well the consequences of plastic pollution. They're fed up of seeing their parks and streets and rivers polluted by plastic waste, and they want us to take action. We've ta taken an, a global approach on plastic by 2030 to ban it, and we're committed to getting rid of single-use plastic by 2021, and we're going to act to help our environment and our economy. The Honourable Member for Megantic Glarable, we know that plastic pollution is an issue. We have to take care of it. But the problem is that the Liberal solution is disastrous for Quebec. There are companies that produce packaging that employ thousands of workers in Brome, Missisquoi, and in Belle Chasse, Les Chemins Lévis. These workers' jobs are at risk. They don't do single use plastics, they help families survive and put food on the table. We have to save these companies and these jobs. What are they doing? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think that the Conservatives must know that the list of banned products, well, there's only six. And recycling will be possible. This is very important for the economy and the environment. There are a lot of opportunities that come with recycling and to keep plastic in our economy. Southwest. Sounds like the minister's trying to have it both ways, minister, downplaying his announcement. And for good reason, after five years of hauling out Canada's energy industry, the Liberals have now set their sights on our manufacturers. Plastic manufacturers employ thousands of blue-collar workers across the country, including in my home region, Atlantic Canada. When the federal government's pandemic procurement plan failed to deliver needed protective products, Canada's plastic manufacturers stepped in and produced the PPE that we need to stay safe. Now Otto wants to call these jobs toxic. Unionized workers across the country want to know why the Liberals keep attacking their families' paychecks and livelihood. Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I would invite my honourable colleague to actually read the announcement. The focus of the announcement is a comprehensive approach to addressing the issue of plastic pollution in our environment. 
We have enormous amounts that go into our landfill and into our rivers, lakes and oceans, but doing so in a way that focuses on enhancing recycling, enhancing recycled content, so that we actually are growing a recycling industry in this, uh, in this country that will employ thousands of Canadians. At the end of the day, it is possible to protect the environment and grow the economy, something they just don't understand. The Honourable Member for St. John's East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Loblaw has made more than $1.6 billion in extra profits during the pandemic, but they don't want to spend the $3 million it would take to give their workers in Newfoundland and Labrador a decent wage. 1,400 of their Dominion store workers have been on strike for seven weeks trying to get back the $2 per hour they got as pandemic pay, the only raise they received since 2018. The Prime Minister may not be able to force corporations to pay their staff properly, but will he join with us in forcing corporate pandemic profiteers to pay their fair share of taxes. The Honourable Minister. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As Canadians take unprecedented action in the fight against COVID-19, workers on the front line and in essential services are stepping up to serve their communities. The pandemic has put a tremendous burden on these workers who are saving lives, ensuring the safety and integrity of our food supply and providing essential retail services. Our government will ensure that they are properly compensated for their efforts and through a new transfer of up to $3 billion to the provinces and the territories, we will provide a temporary increase to the salaries of the millions of low income workers deemed essential in the fight against COVID-19. Well, member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, almost a billion dollars in promised support for young people is missing because of the Liberals' we scandal. Today, La Presse had a story about students who are struggling during the pandemic and worried about their futures. They're graduating, they want to work, but many will end up in precarious jobs and they're drowning in debt. Mr. Speaker, they feel abandoned. When will the government commit to delivering the money they promised in the CSSG? Will they commit to using it to help students reduce their debt? But Minister. Mr. Speaker, our commitment to helping Canadians throughout this pandemic has been clear from day one. When it comes to supporting youth and students, we will continue to be there for them. And that's exactly why we brought forward a $9 billion plan in support of students, including the Canada Emergency Support Benefit and Canada Emergency Student Benefit, including making sure there was no to, um, payments of Canada student loans, including interest, increasing the number of jobs through the Canada Summer Jobs Program, because we recognize that there is a diversity of needs for young people, and we will continue to work with them and be there to support them throughout this entire pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Speaker, I'm encouraged by the recent Unifor Ford collective bargaining agreement and what this multi-billion dollar investment means for the future of Canadian auto manufacturing. As member for Hamilton East Stony Creek, I represent Canada's biggest steel producer and hundreds of related manufacturing operations. Can the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry advise the House how our government plans to ensure the resilience and revitalization of Canadian industry for the millions of Canadians that depend on it for their livelihoods? Well, Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Hamilton East Stony Creek for his question and continued advocacy on behalf of workers. Today, we announced a historic $1.8 billion investment, including a $295 million investment, federal investment, to set up Ford Motor Company of Canada's electric vehicle production in Oakville. This will position Canada as a global leader in a growing market help grow our green economy, and secure 5,400 good-paying production jobs across Canada. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Fisheries has let things escalate to an unacceptable point in Nova Scotia. A problem that was once confined to a few towns along the Fundy Coast now impacts fisheries from Saulnierville to Inverness. This government has a responsibility to develop an Indigenous fishery alongside the commercial fishery. This government has had five years of talk and no action. When will the minister actually get serious about the problems occurring under her watch in her home province? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since day one, we have been focused on making sure people stay safe and, and making sure we lower the tensions on the water. To that end, Mr. Speaker, we have been in conversation with both industry representatives as well as First Nations, and we are now at the negotiation table with the First Nations communities. We're looking for a path forward, but we know that this is a very difficult situation, and we'll continue to have those uh, conversations and those meetings with those, com those First Nations communities to make sure that we implement their, their charter rights. Thank you. Honourable Member for Tobik Mactiquak. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has had weeks to get to Western Nova Scotia and resolve this crisis. The ongoing fisheries crisis is a direct result of the Minister and this Liberal government's inaction over the past five years. The Minister has been in her position for over a year now and comes from a riding where fisheries is of vital importance. The failure of this Liberal government to act has undone years of reconciliation work. Their inaction has pitted neighbor against neighbor and fanned the flames of this dispute. When will the minister get representatives from all affected fishing communities to the table and resolve this crisis? Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I said, this is a very complex issue. This is something that's deeply personal to many, many people. We are working with First Nations communities right now to make sure that we are able to implement their uh, rights that were affirmed under the Supreme Court Marshall, Marshall decision. We are also in conversations with, with our uh, commercial harvesters to make sure that we're hearing from them as well. Mr. Speaker, this is going to be a, a uh, a situation that we're working on a solution for that's long term. I will continue to have those meetings. I will continue to work diligently to make sure that we address this situation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridge is Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, for 16 years, the Young Subway Extension has been a priority for York Region, but this Liberal government refuses to invest. York Region delivered a business case in 20, 2009 and another business case in 2013. And in 2017, this government invested in a preliminary design and engineering study. They wouldn't have done this if the project wasn't sound. So what are these Liberals hiding? What's the real reason this government won't invest? Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have a bilateral agreement with Ontario that will see the federal government invest over $11.8 billion in Ontario over the next decade, including $8.3 billion for public transit. Success on large, complex re projects requires all orders of government to work together, and we remain committed to working with provincial and municipal leaders to prioritize public transit projects, get them funded, and get them built. In fact, we've implored the government of Ontario to submit business cases on some of their major GTA and other transit lines and look forward to more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind the honourable members uh, who are joining us remotely, if they're not speaking, please make sure that your uh, microphone is muted. The honourable member for Aurora Oak Ridge is Richmond Hill. And yet, Mr. Speaker, this government won't invest in the Young Subway extension. The business case to extend the Young Subway line is obvious. The Young line is bursting at the seams with 800,000 commuters a day and almost 100,000 of them passing through Finch. The Young Subway extension will create 60,000 jobs, reduce gridlock, and deliver economic growth for the entire GTA. The need for a union station of the North in York Region is is clear. What's the real reason this government won't invest? Honorable Minister or Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, communities from coast to coast to coast rely on transit projects to get built, to get them from home to work to school to meet their daily needs and services they need on a daily basis. And this government is committed through an historic community investment program, $180 billion over 12 years, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that residents of communities from coast to coast to coast get the services they need. And we're committed to that plan, which by the way, Mr. Speaker, is going to create a million jobs as we roll it out. The member for Joliette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Commercial Rent assist Assistance Program is a complete fiasco. It was so badly designed that Quebec had to step in to help. It's obvious that supporting landlords rather than tenants and asking la landlords to shelter to rather to shoulder a quarter of the cost wouldn't work. Indeed, 
Not even half the money set aside was spent. When will this government overhaul its commercial rent assistance program so that, as its name says, it'll actually help tenants pay their commercial rent? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for the question. As he'll be aware, when this pandemic uh, first raised its head, we jumped into action to support Canadian households and businesses. In particular, we advanced programs to support the fixed costs of businesses, such as the emergency business account, the wage subsidy, and of course, the commercial rent assistance program. Going forward, if my honourable colleague cares to take note of the throne speech, he'll see that we've committed to offering further supports to expand the emergency business account and specifically help with the fixed costs of doing business. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member can rest assured that when businesses are facing difficulties as a result of this public health emergency, our government is going to be there to support them. The member for Joliette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Parliamentary Secretary for his response. We're looking forward to seeing what support is coming because it's been six months since our businesses have waited for the federal government to fix its commercial rent assistance program. We needed help during the first wave, but because Ottawa didn't deliver, businesses had to take on extra debt. Six months later, we're in the second wave, and taking on more debt is not an option anymore. The federal commercial rent support program doesn't work because the eligibility because of the eligibility criteria we're in the second lockdown for 8 days now so when will the government fix this program Mr. Speaker, I take umbrage with the allegation that our supports have not reached Canadian households or businesses. In fact, certain programs have reached millions of Canadians to help them keep a job and help businesses keep their workers on the payroll. I would be happy to continue the conversation as we have throughout the course of this pandemic with my colleague, the critic from the Bloc Quebecois, if he has specific suggestions on what program design ought to look like. In the meantime, we're going to be hard at work developing programs that help businesses keep their doors open and workers on the payroll. Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, it's been reported that the U.S. Trade Representative is contemplating putting protectionist measures on Canadian blueberries. The B.C. Blueberries Council has been forced to hire a legal team because of this government's routine trade relations blunders. The worst part about this, Mr. Speaker, is that farmers from the West Coast in the Fraser Valley and the East Coast in Oxford, Nova Scotia, have never been a priority for the Prime Minister. What exactly does this government intend to do to prevent escalation in trade relations with our closest ally and trading partner? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Honourable Member for that uh, question. And I want to assure her, and indeed all Canadian farmers, producers, the agri-food industry, that Canada will always stand up for you. Our government is concerned about the decision, the U.S. decision, to launch the Global Safeguard investigation on fresh and frozen blueberries. Our agricultural products and exports are not contributing to harming the U.S. market, and Canada expects the U.S. to respect the new NAFTA safeguard provision. So rest assured that we're going to actively participate in this safeguard investigation to defend the interests oh, of our you'll have to call industry. Me after. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Honourable um, uh, Minister of Diversity, I, your, your, your microphone is on. Thank you. Uh, the Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving, yet Canada's poultry, egg and turkey farmers are still waiting for support measures that they've been promised by this government as a result of trade concessions. The government is not acting thankful to these farmers who have been working hard and giving to ensure Canadians are fed. The time for talking and platitudes is over. The time to deliver results is long overdue. Mr. Speaker, it's almost Thanksgiving. How much longer do these farmers have to wait uh, to get their, their concessions? Full Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to reassure my colleague and all producers, poultry and egg producers, that we will proceed with the compensation. And we have committed to make the announcement before the end of the year for the compensation related to uh, CETA and CPTPP. And the conversation is ongoing for NAFTA. We care about our farmers, Mr. Speaker. This agreement was very important for the Canadian economy and very important for the agricultural sector as a whole as well. Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. 
Mr. Speaker, 2020 has been a tough year for farmer Tim Bowes in my riding. First, the new U.S. trade agreement hurt his turkey production, cost him a hundred grand. Next, the COVID-19 restrictions put salt in the wound. When he thought it couldn't get worse, last weekend sections of his popular corn maize were destroyed. Tim is heartbroken, like many Canadian farmers who are asking their government for the support they need to keep putting food on our tables. When will Tim get the help he was promised? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know how hard it has been uh, for our farmers uh, last uh, last year. Uh, they had to face many challenges, and we want to thank them because we were able to rely on them to have good food on our tables. You know that I'm working very hard with my provincial colleagues to improve the business risk management. These programs are there to support, and uh, we are committed to make it even better. And for our supply produce, uh, supply managed producers, we will also proceed with the compensation as promised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Saint Leonard, Saint Michel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since the spring and in light of the current situation in Quebec this month, entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses have been hit hard by the economic impact of COVID. Over the last few months, I met with entrepreneurs and families in my riding of Saint-Léonard-Saint-Michel, and many of them shared their concerns about the Canadian economy. Can the Minister for Economic Development and Official Languages tell us what the federal government has done for the economic recovery of the Greater Montreal area, and more specifically, for the east end of Montreal? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to my colleague for her important question and for her excellent work. In fact, this is why we had good news, the Prime Minister and myself, last Friday, because Montreal is in lockdown again, and we need to help families and workers. And that's why we've invested an extra $600 million in our regional economic Deve development agencies. For Montreal, $30 million and $750 million for the Montreal Chamber of Commerce. We're will always be there for Montrealers, and especially those in eastern Montreal and Saint-Léonard, Saint-Michel. Mr. Speaker, once again, a Liberal government policy is causing unnecessary financial stress to taxpayers. Darrell is a pensioner in my riding who relies on the GST credit to make ends meet. He filed his taxes on time, yet received a letter from CRA stating he now has to repay the GST credit, even though his income has not changed. Why? Because although the Liberal government extended the filing deadline, they failed to tell people that this could cost them the GST credits. Why can't this government simply reassess the credits after filing? Why are they adding the financial stress to Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, uh... Mr. Speaker, our government. Um... <laughs> Madam Minister, I'm sorry we've lost you. I think you may have muted yourself. You're back. Can you please begin with your answer again? Mr. Speaker, our government agrees that this is a difficult time for Canadians. Our government will always do what it can to support them. The CRA will put people first and will always provide good services to Canadians. I would invite my colleague across to get in touch with my offices and we'll follow up with his request. Member for Medicine Hat, Carson Warner. Speaker, communities in my riding are ready to start their infrastructure projects now. Aging water and wastewater systems, roads, recreational uh, centres, utility upgrades all need repairs. Small rural communities are in need of support in order for these projects to move forward. This Liberal government's utter failure on completing infrastructure projects doesn't provide them much hope, however. My communities are waiting, and they want to know, where is their help? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with th what this difficult time has shown us is that every dollar we invest in public infrastructure can and must do triple duty. Mr. Speaker, our government is investing in infrastructure projects that are creating jobs across this country and growing our economy. We're investing in infrastructure so that everyone gets a fair shot at success wherever they live in Canada. And we're investing in infrastructure that makes our communities cleaner, 
and more resilient. Over the next two years, our government is to committed to creating a million jobs and building strong communities through investments in infrastructure like public transit, clean energy, broadband, affordable housing for Indigenous peoples, and the pipe services that my friend just mentioned. The member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, this government last March created a request for proposals for PPE for Canadians. There's a company in my riding which for 20 years has been dealing with Health Canada. It's followed the entire process, but unfortunately, it's announced that there were anomalies in the uh, compliance process. I wrote to the minister last August, and I'd like to ask the prime minister whether he can ensure that his minister will not favor liberal cronies and that the minister will respect Canadian companies. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to uh, communicate with the member opposite about the specific company in question later. But I will say this in general, the regulators have very strict protocols to ensure that all product meets specificity about accuracy, about integrity, about the ability to actually do what it purports to do. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2015, our government has made it a priority to, to improve water infrastructure on reserves. We come a long way in ending long-term drinking water advisories on reserve and preventing short-term advisories from, from becoming long-term. In my riding, many constituents and groups like Rotary Club of Guelph, Water First, Water, Wellington Water Watchers, the University of Guelph researchers, shared value solutions, and many other businesses care about these efforts and the vital work that still needs to be done. Can the Minister of Indigenous Services please speak to the outcomes we've already achieved and update the House on the important next steps? Minister of Indigenous Services. Mr. Speaker, despite being in a global pandemic on Monday, I was proud to congratulate residents of Grassy Narrows First Nations and Wajir Sonagum on their recent elimination of all long-term drinking water advisories affecting their communities. We are working aggressively to meet the spring 2021 deadline and to date 96 long-term drinking water advisories, the result of decades of government neglect have been lifted. While we have more work to do, we will not stop until every community on reserve has access to safe and clean drinking water. Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, COVID is having a devastating impact on the financial viability of airports across northern Canada. This summer, for example, Timmins Airport suffered an 89% drop in passengers, while Sault Ste. Marie suffered a 99% drop. This is unprecedented. And yet northern airports remain on the front lines for medical services, food transportation, and dealing with forest fire refugees. So my question is to the Minister of Transportation. When is he going to step up and answer the call of the northern mayors to address the financial crisis that we're facing with airports in the time of COVID? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for the question, and it is indeed very important that we ensure that northern parts of our country are provided with essential travel for medevacs and for provision of essential foods and supplies. And that is why we put in place a program earlier this summer, which will provide up to $174 million to specifically take care of 140 northern communities. That is our recognition that we must provide those services to the north. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Mr. Speaker, when most people think about the future of energy, they will refer to wind farms, geothermal, solar, but far too often we forget about the power reclaimed through energy efficiency. Let us also not ignore the fact that some will try to make us believe that nuclear energy can still be considered clean, safe, and reliable. The reality is that it's pointless of dreaming of a greener future if we're not investing massively today on how to preserve our energy, reducing demand. My question is to the Minister of Energy Resources. How much precisely is the government projected to invest to intensify energy efficiency in comparison to the upcoming investment to increase Canada's reliance on nuclear power? Honourable Minister of the Environment. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, energy efficiency is a critical piece of moving forward with an effective climate plan. It's also an opportunity for us to think about how we create jobs and economic opportunity for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. It is, uh, it is part of a plan that will obviously need to include a focus on renewable energy, how we actually reduce emissions in all sectors across the country. Certainly, the, uh, the announcement today by the Prime Minister and Premier Ford with respect to zero emission vehicle manufacturing is a critical piece of that plan as well. We, are, we will be moving forward uh, to address all of those issues.